Address is GA099-2539. And of course, this is your home of fearless, credible and independent journalism. Uh, some of the stories we're bringing you, Finance Minister designate Ken Oforiata, as you saw there, has been defending his stewardship of the nation's purse as he seeks another chance. His relationship with several entities within the financial sector, government financial sector, has come up for scrutiny. We'll bring you highlights of his answers at the vetting we started yesterday. Auditor General directs former director, former rector of the UPSA, Professor Joshua Alabi, to refund almost 300,000 cities paid to private legal firm Leta and Brew as legal fees because they did not, according to the audit service, offer any legal services. We'll be hearing from the man in question, Professor Joshua Alabi. And police say investigations into the death of a 22-year-old in the eastern region has begun. The man is said to have slipped and fallen into a pit. We are live on the ground. Also coming up, no picnics and wild celebrations for Easter. That's a warning coming from the Ghana Police Service as the season draws close. Details shortly. And the pause is brought to you by Global Communities Dignilu, affordable, safe sanitation. Join us on DSTV 421, Go TV 144. We're streaming live on YouTube and our other social media handles. My name is Gifty Ando Apia. Please be my guest. Well, as you've been watching here live on Joy News and also monitoring on our radio and our online platforms, the finance minister designate Ken Oforiata has been defending his stewardship of the nation's purse for the past four years. And we know that he's seeking another chance, having been appointed by President Okufado. In the vetting we started since yesterday, his relationship with several financial entities or entities within the financial sector has come up for scrutiny. We'll bring you some highlight of what he's been, how he's been answering those questions since yesterday yesterday one of the key questions that came up was his handling or his uh, uh, his initi initiative which is the ijapa deal and his handling of same listen to what he said about it well, your policy is to reintroduce the ijapa royalties deal can you give us the assurance that he's seeking to appoint transaction advisors in the future you would be compliant with Article 1815 of the Constitution and the decision in Attorney General versus Faro Atlantic Company Limited. Mr. Chairman, I, mean, I think I, I, I mentioned uh, a fundamental flaw uh, in the approach that the OSB took with regards to whether he gave us a chance to respond or not. And I think that should be of keen interest to this House as just a rule of law. Um, and so to then go on to um, accept, acknowledge a document in which your citizens were not able um, to um, give their views on that, I think it's something that we should not encourage. I do not feel that we broke uh, any rule, and I think the AG uh, will be able to give you a firm assessment of that. I think such conjectures you know, are inimical to growth, and it does not help um, the kind of freedom um, of policy orientation and innovation that we require for this country um, to grow. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you consider that Ghana is the largest um, uh, exporter of gold in Africa, uh, and still this is the nature um, of our industry, I think it stands to pause that something different must be done. And something different must be done within the remits of our constitution. And that is why we are resubmitting to find out the kings. But I think the philosophy of trying to get more equity, trying to leverage our resources, is something that we should all uh, consider and know that it's important um, for us to transform. Um, so, um, and I do not believe that we broke uh, any rules um, by the way in which the procurement was done. 
Finance Minister designate Keno Foriata there. Well, the Office of the Special Prosecutor on, uh, resigned on the back, uh, giving several reasons, part of which included the Ejapa deal, which the Minister designate has just been uh, defending. Yesterday, there was a question as well about the role that the Office of the Special Prosecutor played. You heard the Minister say that he believes that they were not given uh, the, a fair chance to respond. Along with this came also the question about conflict of interest. The minister-designate has been answering these. Clearly, um, there's quite a bit of um, cynicism of that transaction. And, and for me, for the House, um, for such a report um, to be put out to the public um, without us or uh, myself as Minister of Finance uh, having a chance um, to discuss it, um, I, I, I think is a disservice um, to our democracy. Uh, and that is such a fundamental right that I think we all as a people uh, should be careful uh, about such things. Um, uh, and, and so um, the speculative issues and the risk associated with most transactions, um, discussions by resubmitting to, to Parliament uh, would enable us um, to, to work those things out um, so that it is. But, but we should also also note, I mean, beyond um, that, and, and the reason why I brought the Act up, was the Act was was well debated uh, and put in, in, into into motion. Um, I, I think risks are part of um, every investment that you make. Um, Parliament gives me um, the honours to to go and raise bonds. Our minister, the distance between you and us here is far. Yeah. So kindly make sure, yes, you speak into the mic so we can hear you. Thank yes, you. Um, so Parliament gives me uh, the mandate to raise $2, 3000000000 $3 billion uh, with all sorts of risk. Uh, and so far these um, three years, uh, we have brought the best pricing um, that the country or comparable countries could enjoy. Um, I do not know why um, that um, um, type of performance will then not reflect uh, in the way in which um, that report uh, was put. Forged with Imara Holding as transaction advisors. Now, many people got agitated with the involvement of Data Bank because of your previous association with Data Bank. You are co founder of Data Bank. Now, to lend credence to this agitation, Data Bank then decides on the 10th of February 2021 to withdraw from the EJAPA deal as a transaction advisor. Uh, some of the reasons Data Bank canvassed for its withdrawal was that some political actors sought to make capital out of their involvement as transaction advisor because of your status as a co-founder of Data Bank. Honorable <laughs> nominee, with hindsight, would you say the participation or the involvement of Data Bank as a transaction advisor amounted to conflict of interest. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that's um, uh, an area that, you know, I've already alluded to, uh, that the House should be clear on passing um, the Act. Uh, but, but the question that really and, the, and the, that we should debate, I, I know that uh, in my capacity uh, as a, a public service official, without being a director but co-owner of that company, uh, I was not part of any decision making um, with regards to that. But I, I think we should, we should be having 
you know, truly a broader discussion about um, Ghanaian enterprise and therefore um, how uh, independent um, uh, and experienced um, entrepreneurs uh, can join government um, at any point uh, in time. So, Mr. Chairman, here is a company that is 30 years old. Here's a company that started with borrowing $25,000. Here's a company that started um, in, um, I guess, uh, can't amount to a place you would not think an investment bank could start. But that's the resources a Ghanaian entrepreneur had to start that. After 30 years, with 500,000 accounts of Ghanaians, a billion cities under management, offices around the country, having participated in every euro bond transaction since we started in 2007. Are we truly saying that in the event of anybody becoming an attorney general, you can use your law offices in the event of being a finance minister? I think those are fundamental questions. And therefore, if the rules are clear um, on uh, what you are um, talking about. Uh, I, I don't think we should um, encourage um, such cynicism uh, because it just goes to poison the environment and we may lose um, good. Um, I don't think there was any conflict of interest straight away because uh, I was not part of the decision. I think the first class nature of the institution speaks to itself. I think the Ghanaian entrepreneur in Unity that has brought it this far must be praised uh, and we should be encouraging uh, our companies to grow so that we can begin um, to do the euro bonds ourselves. Finance Minister Ken Ofeata, designate Ken Ofeata there yesterday speaking on conflict of interest, the Ijapa deal and the way that they, in his opinion the office of the special prosecutor handled the matter. Well there have also been fears among public sector workers that salaries may not be see any increases anytime soon although there have been some assurances from the government on the matter. As the finance minister designate phased the appointment committee yesterday, negotiation of wages within the public sector was one of the questions that came up, as well as government plans when it comes to settling of judgment debts. Listen. There is no definite determination, as is expected, under the Labour Act of Trapatite, some understanding on public sector pay whether adjusted upwards or maintained, that is not uh, conveyed in this particular budget statement. So it appears to me that public sector workers and civil servants, local government, don't know their fate yet. How come is missing? Because I know since 2014, 2015, we've worked out a strategy where it allowed you to have sufficient time to pay. including a determination of the minimum wage. What's your thinking on compensation generally post-COVID and in particular an assurance their fit. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much indeed um, for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you notice that um, uh, we have had a relatively peaceful uh, environment during this time, uh, and that's because um, the, the, the two ministries um, have made a special effort um, um, to create uh, a partnership of labor and employers uh, which enables um, information sharing and understanding of where we are going um, as um, as a government uh, and I think we have we have kept faith um, with that uh, and so uh, mr. chairman I can assure you that we are clearly aware of the uh, of the level of salaries um, that we have uh, for our people. Uh, we also know the impact uh, on our revenue. Uh, and, and by all means, we'll strike a balance that is sustainable 
um, to, to support us. Um, so let me assure you that um, uh, we would not um, compromise uh, on, on, on fair negotiations. So will there be negotiations? There, ha there has to be negotiations. Acceptable growing of judgment debts, judgment debts, all of it occasioned by uh, an act of omission or commission on behalf of ministers of state, they commit the state and then abrogate contracts, the phenomena of judgment debt. What do you intend to do about that as Minister for Finance, should you get confirmed? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I, I think you know as a corollary to uh, the expenditure uh, commitment issue um, would be um, uh, would be a situation where you don't even get there because it can't even come through. Um, but even with judgment debts, um, I think uh, we have tried very hard um, to even renegotiate after uh, the court's judgment. Um, so yes, it's a leakage that we are very aware of and would like to blunt. That's about wages of public sector workers and judgment debt. So how much do we all owe as Ghanaians? And to what extent is that is the computation of those debts accurate? That's something that Mr. Foriata has been talking about. He's also been given details of how much funding has been advanced by the Bank of Ghana to the government of Ghana. The fact of the matter is that when you read the document, the fiscals, you would know what our debt uh, liabilities are, and that is a fact. The question for any nation, you know, is to determine how best we manage this. It's not, um, and, and we had argued um, with the international community uh, that this is a special event, uh, and until such time as we know the full um, cost of it, uh, we are not going to add it together. We have moved to a point, as I've explained to you, um, that we are going to do, but never was it not disclosed. Uh, Chairman, when you say you don't know, you, in both your budget 2020 2021, you attribute 21 billion as responsible. Why are you not adding that to total debt? It is known and is disclosed. What liability is it? And whose liability is it? We need to know. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I mean, I, I think we could go on through this ad nauseum. The question is, was this disclosed? And it was disclosed. Could you add up to come to a summary? You will be able to add up to a come to a summary. So the position is that it's disclosed it, but not added? Is there a new normal? There's a new normal. Have I told you how we are going to be doing it? And I, I've told you that once we are clear on that uh, by the third quarter or fourth quarter, that that will be normalized. How about the Bank of Ghana finance government for the fiscal year ending 2020? Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think there was some anomaly. I mean, we, we did a 10 billion um, asset paper um, with Bank of Ghana. So beyond the 10 billion, any other commitment from the Bank of Ghana to government that you are aware of? Um, Mr. Chairman, that, that, that was the main um, transaction. Um, so as far as we are concerned, only 10 billion was the amount the Bank of Ghana financed government. That's Is my, that correct for our record? Up to my recollection. Yes. And any figure to the contrary? We mean otherwise that you are not candid to this committee? No, it doesn't mean that, Mr. Chairman. It means I will check on that number and let you. You know. didn't check before coming? Just 10 billion. I know for a fact that it's not 10 billion. Well, I think people have been talking about 22 billion, etc. Not people. You are Minister for <laughs> Finance and Minister for Finance designate. What are the numbers? How much? Did the Bank of Ghana finance the government of Ghana? When you came to borrow the 10 billion, you referenced the Bank of Ghana Act and the limits within as a percentage of government revenue in the previous year would could be used for that purpose. How much did the Bank of Ghana finance government? Thank you, Chair. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, I will stick um, to the 10 billion. Um, any explanations uh, of other, I'll get to the House. Two more answers that the minister has been giving on two key sectors, Ghana's security, and in, in which he speaks about a security fund that has been put together, and then a question also, also, also about LGBTQ and the fact that conversations over that matter has come up in Ghana since Ghana criminalizes um, LGBTQI activities. But he said it, the question was whether or not Ghana will be uh, bound to any conditionalities coming from countries who support our budget, who also believe in LGBTQI. So let's listen to the minister on the country's security uh, and funding for it and LGBTQI conditionalities for loans. Ministry of Finance is required to establish a peace and security fund to help equip our security agencies so that they can position themselves in a manner that would make it possible for them to protect us. I omitted to add that the Gulf of Guinea has been adjudged as the most dangerous uh, sea in the world. And yet, that is where our oil resources are located. Honorable Minister, if you're given the nomination, what strategies do you have to raise funding to equip our country's um, security agencies in the face of the threats that we are currently faced with? Thank you. Thank you very much, and that's um, truly an excellent question. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the issues um, we face, uh, that is a gap between uh, our savings, um, and as you know, we are running a budget deficit, which therefore goes to suggest um, that there has to be some accommodations and repurposing, uh, etc., um, to be able to, to, to do that. Uh, but, but I think um, over um, the period uh, that we talk about, uh, both the Ministry of Defense, Interior, Fire, etc., uh, have gotten more resources than they have. Uh, we are funding uh, forward operating base um, to be able to um, tackle the issue of protecting um, our oil uh, reserves. Um, but within the sort of the Accra Initiative um, uh, and the Ghana Boundary Commission uh, and various things we are doing is certainly to look at uh, national security because to be able to maintain our status as a pillar of stability uh, and, demo uh, and uh, democratic governance, uh, there has to be security. Uh, we also are at a point where I think um, the, the ECOWAS uh, protocols uh, enables our neighbors to literally stay here at nauseum I mean, without uh, the 90 days. Uh, and given our attractiveness, I think we're going to have more of an influx. Um, so the, the, there's a discussion uh, that we are having um, to see how um, we can raise the appropriate resources uh, for that. Uh, but I think that really, in a sense, um, should lead to um, some amount of empathy when you begin to ask about um, some places being capped or uncapped uh, and measure it against you know the, the potential cost. The US and other Western nations have made recognition of LGBTQI rights are some of the conditions under which support will be granted to such nations. As the man who follows up on every negotiation the president makes on issues of our support, what is your take on this conditionality by the Western nations in order to advance support and aid to a country like Ghana? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm not clear that it's been established as a conditionality. Uh, but truly, I mean, for example, if you look at um, the decision uh, the president took with regards to termination of PDS, in which $190 million, um, therefore, um, had to be left on the table. I think our sociology um, uh, and uh, our traditions um, are the most important enduring legacy uh, that we have. And so we'll make decisions that suit our Ghanaian purpose so that we can develop in the way we want to develop. Ken Oforiata there. As a, that was what happened yesterday, except from the vetting yesterday, because that's when the uh, vetting started. It continued today, and we'll bring you some except as well from today. Today, uh, some, he, between yesterday and today, his relationship with some organizations uh, who, which operate within the financial sector have also come up for scrutiny. Of course, data bank and enterprise insurance have been on top of the list. But today, there was mention of Dachi funds, which uh, manages funds with Get Fund, and KGL, which works or do, does some work with the National Lotteries uh, Authority, as well as McKenzie Consultancy. The minister-designate has been asked about his relationship in these organizations and the roles that these organizations play within the government agencies uh, in, within which they operate. He's been answering questions on that, as well as recomposition of the Ghana Revenue Authority Board. The thing I want to find out from you is that the McKenzie Consultancy with GRA, how was it procured? Um, that, that will be the, the process that um, GRA put into place um, for that to occur. Was it a sole source? Was it a publicly advertised? Were they competitive bidding to arrive at McKenzie as the consultancy to, to deal with GRA with regards to what you wanted to do that's a mobile uh, revenue uh, to boost revenue collection was what procedure was used in procuring McKenzie? Um, I'll have to get advice on that from, from GRA. Do you know how much was involved in the consultancy with McKenzie with GRE? I don't have the rates of me. You've not heard that it's about 18.5 billion US dollars. You've not heard that you are the finance minister. GRE works under you. They procure for consultancy worth 18.5 million dollars, and the finance minister is not aware. Um, I, I don't know the efficacy uh, of, of, of that number, but I can, I can check on that. Since Bakazi engaged GRE, has the revenue target set for Bakazi to be able to achieve, was it realized? Um, I think if you look at um, um, the growth of um, revenue, uh, in GRA, um, there's been improvements um, in there uh, as to whether um, they have met sometimes the high uh, expectations that we have um, exacted on them. Um, no, but I think in 2020 uh, we were quite impressed um, with what they did given um, the COVID impact um, of of, of, of their performance. Mr. Chairman, was it as a result of uh, your staff work or measures put in by McKenzie? Are you sure that... Uh... I, I think, Mr. Chairman, that's always a, a difficulty in the entry of consultants in everything, um, where, um, you know, one could, one could question uh, whether it is the, uh, the new approach that is doing it or whether the staff uh, could have done it um, by themselves. And then you look at historical performance uh, and see whether it was beyond um, what they typically do 
uh, to then assess uh, whether um, the consultancy has been helpful um, to them. The board of GRA is usually composed by the finance minister, am I right? Um, yes, we've, um, yes, but um, I, I usually uh, have discussions um, with the presidency on some of these important areas. But basically what it means is that the board cannot be composed without your input. That's correct. Who is NS Akore? NS Akore is a technical advisor um, at the Ministry of Finance um, who I brought in uh, from Data Bank uh, when I was made uh, finance minister. So more or less an advisor to the finance minister, right? That's correct. Are you he's, aware that he's the, also on the board of um, GRA? Are you aware that the law that establishes Ghana Revenue Authority clearly states that the representative of the Minister of Finance will be someone director and above and cannot be below director? Um, yes. Representative of the Ministry of Finance. So why will Enes Akori, who is not a director or above a director, be used to replace a Deputy Minister of Finance on the GRE board? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that, that was uh, uh, a philosophical um, decision with regards to um, the Deputy Minister's um, getting off of the board uh, for both uh, ourselves, Minister of Finance and uh, Minister of Trade, um, that um, uh, because we, we believe it to be uh, more efficient uh, about that. Now, um, I think thank you for um, um, that illumination. Uh, and therefore, it is it is possible to uh, to get a director level um, to um, to the board as, as we select because uh, he could also be um, any member of society that could, could be on the board. So, will you take steps to correct this? Because the law is very clear, you need to use we will call, we will a director call. or a, someone above a director to represent the ministry on GRA board. Mr. Chairman, we will correct this. We have just two more updates to give you from today's vetting of the finance minister designate. There, are, there, there were talks of, well, here are joining news. We did a report on illegal gold exports. We'll bring you that shortly. But the minister was also quizzed about pre-financing of some four helicopters by the country, although those helicopters have yet to be secured. As a, it's a reportage that clearly Ghana is losing over 2.5 billion US dollars every year from the was not very sure whether it's been procured. But I want to find out from whether it's aware of this company, Paramount Group of Company, a South African company. Are you familiar with that company? Very much so, Mr. Chairman. Do you have any relationship with that company or any person within the company? Um, no, Mr. Chairman. In 2018, we took steps to procure these four helicopters and you were able to pay them for the procurement of these uh, four helicopters, am I right? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I think it wasn't only four helicopters, there was uh, issues of um, arms, equipment, etc. Uh, and I believe including those. And I know we have, um, I don't know the numbers, but I know we still have about $12 million um, to be able to, uh, to pay them to complete uh, that package that Ministry of Interior uh, approved um, for them. 
Uh, so it sounds to me uh, like they have delivered um, quite a bit uh, of the armament and other things, uh, and maybe it's, it's a delivery of the helicopters and that may be in abeyance. Chairman, why did we choose to do pre-financing with this uh, paramount group of companies? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, the, the issue of uh, financing um, of procurement issues um, sometimes depending on the urgency um, of which um, uh, the various uh, ministries require uh, leads to certain modifications for that um, to occur. Um, I think Paramount was already uh, doing business in the country actually uh, before uh, the emergence um, of our government, uh, and so they, they must have had, you know, prior experience in terms of how they deliver, etc., etc. Finally, Ken Ofoyata has also been talking about Ghana's gold trade, of which I indicated earlier. Donny's uh, documentary, or Donny's latest documentary, show that people are illegally exporting gold and that's costing the country thousands of dollars. Well, the minister-designate believes that overhauling the structure of the country's gold trade will help deal with this illicit trading. As a, it's a reported that clearly Ghana is losing over 2.5 billion US dollars every year from the mining sector as a result of illicit financial flow. I mean, the whole of this week, a number of radio stations were discussing this. What measures is he put, going to put in place, if given the nod, to help deal with this illicit financial flow? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. I think the, the issue of um, illicit financial flows is maybe 50, 70, uh, billion um, for for Africa, uh, and therefore, in our view, uh, might be easily four or five uh, billion uh, in all sorts of ways um, for um, for for Ghana uh, that we need to put things um, into place um, um, to do that. Um, so first, you have um, the small um, sort of gold mining um, area. Uh, in which we need to tighten uh, exactly how the gold is procured and how it, it, it is taken out. So if you look at the example of, of cocoa board's um, um, structure, um, should we be looking at something similar um, to the small-scale gold industry um, so that um, we fund uh, our capacity um, to be able to uh, buy all the gold and therefore be responsible for export um, to cut out that uh, because it is alleged that uh, the amount of gold that let's say uh, Dubai or India will record from Ghana is very different uh, from our exports. Um, so maybe uh, the Cocoa Marketing Board model uh, may be an interesting one to pursue um, to cut out uh, that. Uh, then on the bigger um, um, gold mining companies, um, basically ensuring that the assaying, etc., cetera, um, is, is witness that we know exactly the purity uh, that is taken. If you look at, let's say, the manganese uh, industry, um, where currently um, they, they tell us uh, the purity, uh, they tell us the price that they earn, uh, and then they also tell us the weight that goes on. And those are all not verifiable. Uh, and therefore, we need to put in place structures uh, to be able to determine that. I think that those um, uh, kind of interventions, uh, when put into place, will make us realize uh, the values that uh, we, we, we deserve um, for that. These have uh, gone on for, for numbers of years. Uh, we've experimented uh, with all sorts of undercover agents, etc. And I think uh, we should be ready uh, to come up with new policies and for those areas. 
The two-day vetting of Finance Minister-designate Ken Ofuriata ended today. My name is Gifty Andopia. You're watching The Pulse. And we'll take a very quick break. When we return, we'll talk to you about what the Auditor General is saying. It is directing the former Rector of the University for Professional Studies Accra, Professor Joshua Alabi, to refund some 300,000, almost 300,000 cities. We'll tell you why. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the show. The Auditor General has directed former Rector of the University for Professional Studies Accra, Professor Joshua Alabi, to refund with interest an amount of almost 300,000 CDs paid as legal fees to private legal firm Litha Brew and Company because, according to the service, there was no work done. This is contained in an audited report of public boards, corporations and other statutory institutions. In the following report, my colleague Elton Brobe looks at the findings and some financial irregularities regularities flagged at the UPSA as well as some other universities including Cape Coast University. If you management of UPS signed a retainer agreement dated 14th March 2014 and paid an amount of 263,000 Ghana cities to law firm Itabriu and Company as retainer fees, but there is no evidence of the provision of any legal service to the university. The report also noted that Litabriu and Company was appointed through sole sourcing without recourse to the provision of the Public Procurement Act 2016. The Auditor General advised that the former Vice Chancellor, Professor Joshua Labi, and Litabriu and Company be made to refund the amount with an interest at the prevailing Bank of Ghana interest rate. The report further advised that management set up a legal directorate that shall facilitate all legal matters for the university to the Attorney General's department. Two officers of the University of Cape Coast, Kwame Feyi, a senior administrative assistant of the University Accra office, and Francis Arthur of the University of Cape Coast Enterprise did not account for a total revenue of 55,000 Ghana cities collected between June 2017 and April 2018. Also, contrary to provisions in the Financial Administration Regulation, the report noted that the College of Distance Education paid an amount of 1.3 million Ghana cities to two contractors for the supply of materials in transit, but the items were never supplied. The items were paid through various certificates issued without indication to items, quantity, unit costs, and others. The audit team did not cite any documentary or physical evidence that such materials had been supplied to the project, even though payments were made to the contractor during the 2012 and 2014 financial year. The Auditor General recommends that management provide list of items, quantity, unit cost, and evidence of supply to the project to justify the payment, failing which the contractor and the officers who authorize the payment should refund the amount of 1.3 million Ghana cities. That's a news desk report. Well, I have been speaking to Professor Joshua Alabi, who says the report is inaccurate and that the law firm in question did render several services to the university and there's evidence to prove same. Listen. In fact, uh, I got to know from Joy FM this afternoon. It has never come to my attention. And I was shocked and surprised that such a report could come out. Uh, you know, um, the purpose of audit is to perfect system. The idea is not to go and catch this. When you go with the mindset of go to catch this, you will do a shoddy job like this. And all it asks with these students is to help to perfect the system. Now, you see, uh, and it is also not true that Tolita never represented the school in any legal system. No, 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 no. There were a lot of legal cases that we referred to where we went to court on our behalf. So you see, I thought that before you come out with a report, you should have gone to... Sincere apologies for that quality of sound there. We'll work on it and bring it back to you. Uh, Joy News Prime much later. But there's more of that uh, on myjoyonline.com. Now, she wants to move beggars from the streets and wants to be a journalist. That's not all. She also wants to change the perception that once you have a disability, the option is to beg. There are, these are the aspirations of Jennifer, a visually impaired girl whose story has gone viral after she was filmed frying Gary. She, sells, uh, she tells Esina Mose that she has accepted her misfortune. Let's now go to the community of Odotum and introduce you to Jennifer. Mm. 
Can you work with a knife and far with your eyes closed? Meet Jennifer, who became visually impaired at age seven. Abandoned by her father, Jennifer lives in the village of Odotum, in the eastern region with her mother. The light in her eyes started dimming at age six and has not been lit again. I became blind, I think glaucoma, and so we, we actually went to the eye checkup and stuff at Emmanuel Eye Clinic. Okay. And uh, I was I was operated on the first day, and everything went well. Okay. But I was I was a kid then, and I couldn't just understand the reason why all of a sudden you start losing your eyesight and stuff. So the following day, yeah, call you know, doctor said, my sister, my mother, my mother, my mother. So I had to do another surgery in college. Since then, I don't know, my, my eyeballs just decided to, I mean, go inside, like, mm. so I, I couldn't even open my eyes normally okay. again and it was that. Jennifer has had to deal with stigma even from those she calls family. Most people in my family yeah, I, feels like my mom, like it's a taboo to have a person with visually impairment. And so this girl can't do anything. And so yeah, I'm always being referred here as a child because they feel like everything that's supposed to do for myself, somebody always does it for me. Even a family member said, I'd rather die than having a child like you. She's currently in the Form 2 at Okwapiman Senior High School and is determined to become a renowned journalist and an advocate for persons with disability. I really want to move beggars from the street into workers. I want to change that concept that once you are a person with disability, you have no option than to go to the street and beg. She tells us about her friend Benedicta, who's been forced out of school. She lives in a Sokori mountain, mm. Massey. The lady can sing like her, something. And all of a sudden, this lady stopped coming to school. Why you go to YouTube and you type, my situation cannot stop me. You mm. find her songs plenty. And they have denied the lady access to good education. She lives in the house with them and she now sings in the market. I will be so proud if I will be able to get Benedict to entry back to school for the blind. Jennifer says her mother struggles a lot, so she helps with her Gary processing business to make ends meet. Six days a week, 4.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. She's able to detect a well-cooked Gary by the sound it makes and the scent it diffuses. Mom, Gary. The sound changes, the scent, okay. and then yeah, how it feels like. So when I hold it, this one, I know that it's not yet to carry. She enjoys the lighter side of life. She loves entertainment. So you know, Hits FM does entertainment all day. So yeah, you listen From to Daybreak Hit, to mm -hmm. Mr. Hagler, to Hit News at One, to the Absolute Definition, Mercury Quay, um, the dawn is so witty. Oh God, um, what? You like hits? Dr. Hits Pound. I love kids. I love, like, I love entertainment. Jennifer is appealing to government to equip her senior high school with special teaching and learning materials since she and her visually impaired colleagues are unable to learn mathematics and science, which are both core subjects. That certainly made my eye well up uh, briefly. My colleague Daniel Dazi had an interaction with Jennifer earlier where she highlighted the challenges that she has had to confront in school. Not all that easy, knowing fully whether you can see the colors. Then when they say this one is green, this one is blue, you can see it yourself, the color of the earth. When they say this person is dark, you know how it feels like. Then all of a sudden, if you want to know whether this money is one city, you, you take it to somebody way and you're saying, it's very, very, very hard. Mm. But that is just life. I had to accept my challenge. We learned earlier that in the school that you're in, you are unable to study some subjects. Yes, uh, we, 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 we don't do math and science because we don't have the, you know, science requires experiments mostly. 
and if you don't have all those things you can do so we lost learning and teaching materials um, um, as, as in the visually impaired section though we, we're in the one class with the people who can see I mean an art two student I do literature art two and um, so anytime there is mass all the visually impaired go out anytime there is signs go out because at, it, it, to, to, to say the truth even if I were to be a teacher and I'll be teaching and I'll know that some people are not partaking it's sometimes annoying so you just have to allow us leave the class so that those who are able to do it do it but it's because we don't have the talking calculators and stuff mm. we can't really do with calculations and all that experiment so yes so how do you feel I mean you want to be a journalist I mean you were saying earlier I'd love to be interviewed by you someday, but um, <laughs> how do you feel when you know that you need these subjects to be a journalist and now you can't study them? Oof. It's, it's so, I don't know, it, it hurts a lot. It hurts a lot. Knowing fully well that I really wanted to be a journalist, I became so disappointed when I discovered that GIJ uh, is not accepting visually, but currently because they don't do maths and science, it hurts a lot knowing that you're being turned away from what you want to be just because of math and science. You don't do math and science. And you know, they are the basics of life. Without math, me, I understand the, those facts. Yes, without math and science, it would be too horrible, you know, so. She's just brilliant, isn't she? Away from that, the Ghana Police Service has served notice that a ban on gathering is still in force as Christians prepare to mark the Easter holidays. The Director of Public Affairs for the Service, Sheila Kesi Abiyeh Bakman, is appealing to the general public to abide by the coronavirus uh, restrictions imposed by President Okufado, which has also legal backing of Parliament. He adds the police will strictly enforce the rules. Easter season is characterized by religious activities and amusement events and therefore the police service is assuring the public that by its mandate we will provide enhanced security. We have observed over the years that during Easter accidents increase. This year we are appealing to the public, the motoring public and all road users to abide by the rules. Yes, police officers and partners will be on the roads and particularly areas that have been mapped up as accident prone and traffic congested areas to manage the situation. But we're also appealing to you to abide by all road traffic rules such that you do not compel us to arrest you. But we're also reminding Ghanaians that this year's Easter celebration will not be characterized by crusades and conventions and pilgrimages and amusements such as street dances and all the fun that Easter is usually characterized by in Ghana. This is because there is a law that bans or limits public gathering. And so for religious activities, we are expecting that religious leaders will hold services that do not go beyond two hours with a maximum of 100 people who will abide by all COVID-19 protocols. Carnivals, festivals, beach gatherings and amusement events are banned. And we are appealing to all Ghanaians not to organize or even participate in any of such. For tourist sites and attractions, there may be a few that will be opened, provided that the organizers can ensure that everybody who comes there wears his or her face mask and abides by all other COVID-19 protocols, including social distancing and the enhanced hygiene. Sheila Beye Bachman, uh, Sheila Kesi Beye Bachman speaks for the Ghana Police Service and there you have it. Well, talking about Easter, yesterday I had a conversation with the ICGC which is embarking on a project to support mentally ill persons in this season. Listen to my conversation. In just a week, we'll be heading towards Easter 2021. As you know, COVID-19 has made it very difficult for us to celebrate it the way that we're used to. 
but there are some who actually cannot celebrate at all because of their economic situation. What about persons living with mental illness? Well, the ICGC says it will make sure that it is not a hopeless situation for people like this. The church is raising funds during the period for the Mental Health Authority to support our brothers and sisters who unfortunately have to deal with this ailment. Well, the church will also organize a special service for frontline workers to appreciate them for their work in this very difficult season. Reverend Albert Okran is a senior pastor at the International Central Gospel Church and is joining us to elaborate a bit more on this project and how you can be a part of it. Reverend, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Gifty, and good to see you. Good to see you, sir. I can, I can always speak about the jollof. Hopefully this is that a lot more of the jollof will come around. I mean, I know you don't know about it, but it came from your house. <laughs> so there's a whole conversation around my house in Jamie, so we'll talk about that one okay. off, off air. Okay, so, so talking about Easter, um, tell us a bit more about these initiatives that the ICGC is putting together to especially support people with mental ailments. Thank you very much. So this is part of what you may want to call a three-part intervention. So the original activity is a health and fitness work we call life work. So ICGC believes in the holistic development of the person. And so every year, the month of March is our health and fitness month. And the main climax is what you call life work, okay. where we come together and do a 12 kilometer walk. It started as a far longer walk, but mm. with time, we've been more <laughs> modest in our aspirations in terms Have of the distance. Have grown old? I know. <laughs> so we do now a 12 kilometer walk, okay. originally starting from the independence. Sincere apologies for that uh, interruption there. We'll bring you that conversation uh, between, between somewhere next week it will still uh, be relevant there but they want you to support uh, with the walk if you go to the icgc page you'll find ways that you can support and way that ways that you can uh, support with your money and ways that you can take the walk as well you're watching the pulse with me and Opia. let's take a quick break we'll be right back you're welcome back Let's take you on a tour of our Ghana Mount series. It was built close to a century ago and served not only as the permanent abode of the overlord of the Wala Kingdom, but also serves the political, religious and traditional symbol of the Wala traditional area. The iconic Wana's palace built with mud bricks and having Y-shaped wooden columns that support its flat roofing is our next destination for our Ghana Man series. Join us this Upper West Region correspondent reports that despite its huge tourism potential, which can better the economic fortunes of the people, they have little benefit from the building cast in the mode of sub-Saharan architecture. Located at the heart of the one municipality and bounded to the left by Limairivori and to the right by Yiji Pong is a beautiful and iconic Wana's Palace. This building is a worldwide decent thing. The whole world knows about it. People do come here to see the building take and go away. Once it is a monument and we are proud of it, we the royals of Wa, we are very proud of it. This monument or architecture, you can see it anywhere. It was constructed using sun dried mud bricks. Unlike other ancient buildings, it has a Y-shaped wooden columns to support the flat roofs of a boost pole framework covered with mud. Its architectural style is a combination of forms and influences from the Morris architecture in South Sudan. As part of the Ghanaman series, I took a tour of the palace regarded as one of the finest and last remains of ancient architectural buildings who needs to be preserved. Nasali Ujongara hails from the Yijila Gate and currently occupies the Duwe skin. He told me how the idea of the building of the palace was mooted. This was initiated by Ishaka Dabila of Walimayiri, who is an imam or who was an imam. After constructing the central mosque by architecture from Bona, 
Yahaya Bundana was the sole financier of the central mosques. So after that, Isaka saw it in his wisdom, brought them here, the replica of the central mosque, and then what they had at Buna. So it was the same architecture he brought here. So he started it with Napelipu, Kami Inu. It was at Bangmarayiri where the bricks were laid, these local bricks. And here, wall was red clay. That is why they call here Ijeh, up to Bangmarayiri, where a large inside semi-story building is situated. That was where they manufactured the bricks from, they mold the bricks from. So carrying them there to this place, you know, it was Liman Yiri, Tagada Yiri, plus the Wala Royals. They were bringing in the bricks and the palace was constructed by them. Before the construction of the palace, there was no central or permanent palace for the Wana. Each of them were staying at their respective palaces constructed for their gates. Inside the Wana's palace is a sitting room who serves as a court. Here, the Wana sits on either the lions or the antelope skin. Any other person coming in here, including the imams, who serves as a spiritual godfather, either has to sit on a cow or a sheep skin. This is the antelope skin, and these two are the lion skin. And this is one. This one you see that is more than 150 years here. So, as well as this. They are very, very old. So why is the one that's sitting on the antelope or the lion skin? This is our symbol of authority. But he is the overlord of all chiefs here. And then in the local language, we call him Berengo or Jara. You know, the lion is the strongest thing in the jungle. And that's the nickname of the lion. So is that the reason why we're having uh, a lion? Uh, yes, in, of course. In front of the, yes, the of palace. course. Indicating our symbol of authority. It is significant to note that this palace has two gates for all the four royal gates in the Wala traditional area. However, at any one particular point in time, only one gate is opened and used. Do you know we are for this engaged on to the skin. We have Iji here, we have Najara, we have Jonyo here, we have Nakpaha. So that, this gate belongs to Iji, uh, the Iji royals and then the Nakpaha royals. And the one that is open? The one that is open. In case uh, one of the people, the fourth passes on, this gate will be closed and then it will go to Jara. Nigeria they will open the other gate. That is how our history is, or that is how the scenario is. Despite this huge tourism potential, coupled with the thousands that will be there to have a glimpse of the ancient edifice, the people benefit little or nothing from it. Upper West Regional Chairman of Togai's Association, Aziz Belpo, himself a royal, lamented about the situation and made some recommendations for the status quo to change. As a tour guide, I am disappointed because we don't have even a simple museum in this palace where tourists can come go in. So tourists come in and the only thing is just to have a look at this building and probably uh, see or engage with the chief and that ends it. Unlike other kingdoms you go, you can see a museum where you can see all relics and artifacts and old pictures of uh, past kings and all these things that symbolizes our culture. So I am calling upon the authorities, the traditional area, uh, the Ghana Tourism Authority Museums and Monuments Board and even the general public. We can do a, a, a public-private partnership where we can have a museum in this palace where tourists can go in. We can. Uh, it can also help us conserve most of these things that we have, our talking drums and all these things. Uh, we don't, they are almost in extinct. You come here and you hardly see these things. But with a palace museum, I think we can better preserve these things. And tourists will be willing to pay more because because when you bring tourists as a guide and there is nothing to show, there is nothing to see, they are reluctant in paying or even donating. So they just give peanuts. But when there is much for them to do or see, uh, you are able to charge them and they are able to pay better as a tour guide. The iconic one House Palace does not only serve as a permanent abode for the Wallachian, 
but also it is the traditional religious and political symbol of the Wala people. It is also the strength, power, and unity of the Wala people. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wa. Rafiq Salam there with that report. Let's take a quick break here. We'll do sports. Oriku is standing by. We'll bring you sports shortly. But talking about tourism, I used, as you saw in the reports that Rafiq put together, I took some seven days of, you know, touring uh, Rwanda. Well, the journey was not just about touring. The core of the tour was to create connections between businesses in Ghana and Rwanda. In this report, I take a look at the expected collaborations between Ghanaian and Rwandan businesses. Annalisa Solano is currently a consultant working at the Labadi Beach Hotel, but as a former manager at the French Chamber of Commerce in Ghana, she's looking to broker some deals with G-Step Tours, a Rwandan touring company using its corporate social responsibility to produce coffee. I realized that coffee and tea are, you know, high on what Rwanda is, you know, known for. Ghanaians love also coffee and tea, and uh, we don't produce coffee and tea, we're very good in cocoa, and so we're talking about how could we potentially take this super coffee to Ghana. She wants the companies to take advantage of the African continental free trade area. Her counterpart at this business-to-business -business meeting is Andrew Gatera, founder of the touring company. He wants to enter the Ghanaian market with this coffee produced and processed by women. We are trying to see how we can cooperate in line of uh, exports and imports, uh, facilitating the locals here, and then uh, uh, to see how she can also link us with the market in uh, Accra, in Ghana, where she has her expertise. Rwanda's trade and industry minister says since the operation of Rwanda Air in Ghana, visits from Ghana to Rwanda has increased from about 950 to 3,535 within a short period. That's what the CEO of Sun Seekers Tours Limited, Kwame Anson, and a counterpart with Sharama Event and Tours, Divine Owasi, are discussing. Rwanda Air has flights connecting um, Accra to Kigali um, presently three times a week, but I think post COVID is going to go up. So we're looking at how we can sell Accra and the rest of Ghana to Tarama. We're just trying to um, fashion out the deal and see what interest her clients will have, what interest our potential clients will have. We can merge the market and be mutually beneficial for all potential clients and clients as well. Because it's really looking positive because there's, there's so much potential and there's a lot that we can do together. Cooperating within the hotel business space, it's what's on discussion on this table among the general manager of Labadi Beach Hotel, Vincent René Ernst, and a traditional leader who was also invited. It is good to travel, to visit places to know what is happening in the world. Moreover, you can't travel without lodging at a hotel. So we have to start learning how to vacate our homes. As well as their Rwandan counterpart, I asked them about the cost of vacationing in Rwanda as a middle-income earning Ghanaian. It's not expensive. Rwanda is... Uh, some people say that it's a high-end destination, but it's, a, it's always affordable. And it becomes a much if we handle the tourists as a, as a group. So what are you expecting out of your trip? It's all about explaining to Ghanaians now. So it can be either cheap or it can be very, very expensive. There's no doubt about that as far as I'm concerned. And isn't that an exciting thing? That the, the, it is open to almost every budget that there is. So I think you should ask yourself the question is that not a question can you afford to go to Rwanda the question can you afford not to go to Rwanda because of the diversity that is available Jerry is one of the tour operators also looking to penetrate the Ghanaian market we are looking at uh, going to Ghana uh, to sell Rwanda just like they are here to sell Ghana and we believe we believe a lot of fruit will come out of this collaboration so are Ghanaians ready for this kind of tourism 
Kwesi Aysen is CEO of Pacific Tours and with the Ghana Tourism Federation. I think we have to market and then promote our own, especially in the times that we find ourselves. Um, regional tourism, of course, and then domestic tourism are the key drivers now. And uh, we will be the best people to sell all these wonderful experiences to them. Well, should you take the step, here are some tips from Adansi Travels manager Gideon Asari who says he is already planning a trip. If you don't have much budget, budget you still want to experience Rwanda, if you are going to Dubai or you are going to any other country, you can put two nights stopover in your, in, your, in your tickets. So you stop here two nights, you can do one night in Kigali, you can do one night in Lake Kivu, and then you have experience of Rwanda and continue your journey. In that case, you are not buying a complete flight, you are only stopping, and that you can have a budget less than $500 to take care of your, your, your meals, your accommodation, the tours, and for a couple. And after all these business to business deliberations, what next? Bella Ahu is president of the Ghana Tourism Federation. The prospects are very good. We are expecting them to come see what we've brought to them, the reality of it on the ground, and then we will now sit and put documents together where uh, uh, MOUs will be signed. The aim of the business-to-business -business session was to ensure concrete steps are taken to link Ghanaian businesses to Rwandan businesses and to create the synergies necessary for import and exports to boost the economies of both countries. It was all crowned. It was all crowned with a luncheon by representatives of the Rwanda's Ministry of Trade and Industry and Ghana's Tourism Authority, as well as the Exports Promotion Authority. Kifti and Apia, join news, Kigali. Rwanda. And that's it for the, this edition today. Let's go to my, that's almost 300k with interest. That story is our top story right there on myjoyonline.com. I don't take salary or per diem. That's Ken Oforiata and that's coming from his, in, uh, his vetting yesterday. Uh, Joe Gatti fails to stop petition against his election. That's also one of the stories being read the most on myjoyonline.com. And abolished 3% withholding tax on gold trade. ASEP tells government that coming, coming with a picture of Ben Boache, who heads the ASEP there. Also, this story, Great Co is owing over 230 million. That's according to the Auditor General's report. You can take a look at that story as well. And if you look on top of the stories, we have all the links there, WhatsApp, uh, LinkedIn, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, and several others. You can just click on the button and share the story so your friends and your uh, connections will know what is happening. My name is Gifty and I bet it's been a long week for you as well. I wish you a great weekend. Have a very good one.